Um, so I'll start with, with the, the basic components of what we deal with here. Uh, and I'll start with the director. And the director is what produces the console that was seen in that demo. The director holds the configuration for the system. It provides the management of the system. It provides uh, the analysis that was seen. And it allows you to do reporting, export reports of that analysis. We'll just put got config in there. Now, the workhorse in the data center is the observer. So the observer is a virtual appliance managed by the director, delivered from the director, and it does the watching of your storage, or the, the, the customer's storage. So we'll show some of the customer's storage here. So we call these the sources, the source filers and the source shares. This is your, your primary storage. This is the, the, it holds the, it's your expensive filers, holds the data that you want your you as a customer, you want your users to be accessing. It's got to be good performance. It's got to be, um, and, it, and it also is probably mirrored, probably backed up, many copies of this that are there for the data protection. And so it's, it's expensive storage, and it's expensive to manage if you've got the, the data that's on that storage. But you might have in your, in your uh, data center, or you might be able to get keeper storage. So we call these the targets. So just as these are NAS filers, SMB, NFS, you can have a NAS filer and NAS target. So are you saying that uh, the source is like primary data and the target is secondary data? In the way that, that the, the storage IT person would see it, yeah. Okay. That, that, that this will be, this, is, this does not have to be expensive. It does not have to be hot stuff. It's not, it's not something that, that is expected to be hit a lot. And also, it's, it's in, in some ways more durable. So when we get to see the cloud storage or object storage, they're just more durable, so they don't need the, the outside administration that the primary storage filers would. So you could also have an object store. Uh, you could actually have a tape backup, you know, tape-backed storage uh, that will have a cache so that it has fast responses, and then when all the cache is filled up, it just it puts that into the tape. It's very, very inexpensive. Are, are you managing the tape library, or? We're not managing the tape library, so there, we have <laughs> partners. Something like Spectra's? Something yes. like Spectra, okay. yes. And so we, we batch up together the files into jobs, and we manage all that from the observer, and then right. give it the job, and, try to, and, and be optimum for what it wants to, to get the data in, in and out. While the, while the metadata that we want to see very rapidly still remains in the cache. Yeah, that stays in the, in the head end. And of course, quintessential, the quintessential target here would be the cloud target. S3, Azure, any S3 compliant cloud is any S3 compliant uh, object store. And the, these would be your targets. So that the objective here is that you've got things here that you don't want here. And you've got storage here that's much cheaper to put it on. But we come in to make your life easier to take the things that you don't want here and put them over here, yet still transparently give you the picture of them as though they're still on those. How does this platforms. impact something like backup? Something like backup? So if you've migrated the data off the main primary storage off to some sort of secondary storage, I would like backup not to actually back that data back up, but I don't know, is, is, the, is the data that's sitting on secondary storage that's been, let's call it archived, being backed up in a daily backup run or something like that? Or? Well, that's up to you. If you put it on a, a, a more fragile um, storage like a NAS, then you, you would want to back that up. If you put it on object stores or cloud stores that, you know, they imply extensive, yeah. extensive robustness. But I'm missing a piece here. So if you have the, the uh, backup, uh, policy that uh, targets uh, to the primary storage, mm -hmm. okay? Do you have to manage a new backup policy also to manage no. the secondary storage? No, so typically we're putting it into object stores and clouds, right? And so they are robust storage with multiple copies. Um, and so they're not backing that up. So what instead is happening, as we said, and Mike will go into it a little bit more, we're leaving some kind of a breadcrumb on the, on the, on the source storage. Right, that gets backed up as a part of the general backup process. Okay. Okay. And then, when if if you need to back if you need to recover it 
for any reason. So let's say it's a 10 gigabyte file. We may have left behind a four kilobyte stub. Not a stub. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not a stub. I knew that crop. was coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so therefore, that's backed up. And if you need to recover, you bring it in, click on it, here it comes. Yeah, but if you're archiving data from your NetApp All Flash FAS to a Synology, it would probably be a good idea to back the Synology up separately. <laughs> uh, so then before I get into more detail here, I uh, want to just mention a few points. So we're, uh, it, uh, Comprise is a distributed, software-only hybrid SaaS, as was mentioned. Um, the, Does it the, have to be SaaS? It does not have I have to some very paranoid clients so who do, don't want so do you to we. know anything <laughs> so about their data. We have them too. We get them more and more all the time. So just as the observers deliver as a virtual appliance, we can deliver a director as a virtual appliance. You can manage it all on premise, on premises, and get those. Um, this is storage field. A paranoia is a good thing. In place. Yes. yes. So if a customer chooses to do it all on site, does that give them? Um, less information into what you're doing with the um, things you do in the SaaS offering, or? No, it's, a, it's exactly the same director. It just is running okay. in their data center. Yeah, so, so they get exactly the same um, visual that, you, that, that was seen in the, with the demo, exactly the same reporting, exactly the same email notifications, everything. Okay. It does need to be attached to play, like email. I mean, they, they have to figure out sure, how they're yeah, gonna, gonna route sure. it out of their data is center. Is there any, um, I mean, based, Looking at the, um, the cloud-based director that you have, is there any kind of data aggregation telemetry that you're getting from all of your customers that you're kind of getting into the, into the product to kind of give some analytics and give some trends to people to see if they're getting the same, I don't know, compression ratios, whatever? So we have, we have call home for those who are on premise, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and allow them, to, again, it's something that they have to agree to. Um, that allows us to bring in that kind of information. Again, it's all statistics and metadata, and meta metadata. And so it's not data about their, you know, it's not their data. Um, and so we collect those. We haven't yet put together overarching aggregates, but we have the mechanism and everything in place. And eventually we will roll that out. And we've done those kind of, in, in yes. the background, we've done some of these to, to give, to, to figure out what, what the, the the yes. statistics look like per vertical so that we can yeah. inform customers that we meet in those verticals. How independent are the crumbs? And what I mean by that is, could you take those breadcrumbs and, and basically move them to another system and still have some uh, relative access to that same target, that there's some translation that occurs that's independent from the host? They are, so, so breadcrumb, we, we, I, I call it a, a comprised dynamic link. And yes, when, if you were to, to do migration of a share from this, say, NetApp to this EMC, that would be done via the observer, and the translation would occur okay. at that. Okay, okay, yes. okay. So, um, but on what um, so the trans offering um, uh, does your, uh, or where does your SaaS offering uh, come from? Is it AWS, is it Azure, is it? We're AWS now, but we can be anywhere. And we, ought, we, the director, we don't yet have a bare metal director. Do we? I don't know. Uh, but we have, we have bare metal on other things. So if you don't like running this in VMware, you can run it on any Hyper-V or, or you're, some people just want the physical storage because they, they realize a lot of networking's going on. They don't want to, they don't trust their hypervisors to handle the network. No. <laughs> okay, so I'm managing this thing and I'm going to migrate all of this data through the observer. But my users aren't that smart, and somebody's going to decide to migrate a whole bunch of data that includes breadcrumbs by dragging and dropping it on their desktop. The breadcrumbs don't break when they do that, do they? So from, from their desktop, if they have a route, the, the breadcrumb goes to the observer. If they have a route to the uh, observer from their desktop, they'll still get okay, to that. Okay, let, uh, let us, hmm. let, is it time yet to talk about bread, how breadcrumbs work? Because you were, you're very clear about they're not stubs, and I'm not fond of stubs myself because I've been in too many places where we have stub files, and 10% of the data is on primary storage, and 90% of the data is on secondary storage, till some idiot user does a keyword search. And then it all gets recalled to the primary storage where there's not enough room for it, and things go bad. 
Yeah. So, so with, with regard to copying off, you have to make an effort to copy those links, right? Right. Otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure. Okay. I think with respect to your question, uh, we have recall policies associated with this. Uh, and you can specify what your recall policies are. So you could say, hey, if it's been hit five times in <clears> 10 days, then I think it's hot. Um, otherwise, what we do is we bring it in. We, you know, you want to still see the data, right? We cache it inside that observer. And so if you have so many hits, okay, until so it hits a recall policy, so my, then it gets. So my SMB or NFS session terminates at the observer. It's in the data path? Is that the way to? I think that's oh, the way to put it. So you all, so, I mean, I can answer some of the questions. Yeah, so, so there are a couple of things. Our, our comprised dynamic links that Mike is talking about, the breadcrumbs, they are really, you know, industry standard symbolic links, right? So if you think about that way, okay. right? So they, they do point to, the link points to um, observer, uh, observers, you know, we have a grid of observers, really, right? So it's, it's a completely scale out architecture in that way. And, and we then know where the data is and then can process the data. Now, to your question that now suddenly a user decides to you know, access a lot of data. Now, if it's only a metadata access, we're not bringing the full data back. A lot of the metadata already exists on the symbolic link. If it's some extended attribute that is not on symbolic link, we will fetch that and, and give the request, but it's not going to come back to your primary storage. Now, if someone goes ahead and starts reading a lot of content, as Kumar mentioned, we have policies in place that we don't have to really replace the whole file back to the primary file system to be able to provide access. So as you mentioned, the access of the cold data, and that's one thing big, and Mike will talk about as well, that we don't come into the hot data path at all. So if you're accessing your primary storage, you continue to access without any, uh, any, any uh, redirection to comprise at all. They access on your primary storage, but if they access cold data, it comes through observers and then we provide the access to it. We don't, put it. we don't put it back on the primary, and that's only roughly you know, less than 1% of your access, right? way less than 1% of your access comes to the data that you haven't touched over one year. You're not gonna, set, you're not gonna access that data that often. Right, and, yeah, and so, when I, so when I say open this old file, the symlink re recalls the file and delivers it to me, but doesn't place it back on the primary. That is correct, okay. that is correct. You can control that. That's and you know, to, you know, to go back to that again, um, as we like to say, as Moth was saying, it's, we sort of like and have an Audubon to the <laughs> secondary storage and a country lane coming back because, again, this is stuff that should be based yeah. on policy, things that you don't need. Now, having said that, I think you'll bring up another point maybe, is that let's say you are an EDA company and you're doing some chipset, you know, chipset version one. Two years later, you're going to be working on chipset version two. There's a bunch of data out there, right? You can, that's when we can do a bulk recall. You, know, you don't want to have to sit there, bring each one back one at a time. We have a bulk recall policy. You can say, hey, I want to, you know, the IT guy will come and say, hey, I want this whole baggage in here, and boom, it starts, and it's back on the, back on the primary storage. And once it's back on the primary storage, it falls inside that policy again. Once it gets old, guess what? It gets pushed back. I had a question, Kumar. Um, since you guys said you had a, a, reset, um, a recall policy, so would that detect any anomalies in, in the event that someone has a data breach and someone wants to try to access a lot of old files? And would that, would that detect that and stop it and say, oh wait, you're not allowed to um, recall that much data? We do have a recall limit policy. Yeah. So you can, if, if you are afraid of, say, cloud extraction costs, as an administrator, you can set a policy that says once we get to 100 files, we can stop it. So if, if someone wants to do it as a, as a security precaution, they, they could set that limit there as well. That's an interesting idea. It's like a reverse fuse. I mean, and you really are kind of protecting yourself from, from outlying events that you wouldn't necessarily be watching. Yeah. yeah. How, how often are you moving data to secondary storage? Is there some periodic interval that like every eight hours or, or something like that where you do this activity or is it constant around, around the clock or? We, we do the activity. And then when, when a, f a full pass is done, we then generally sleep for a week and then do it again. Oh, so you're moving data effectively starting at one week intervals and then however long it takes. Yeah. Well, so that's for the scanning, but is there any, is there any mm -hmm. mechanism that you could change what your company would consider to be the cold data? Yes, so, so the, the policies that decide what get, gets moved are done using that plan. Okay. So that plan that you saw being built and how they were sliding it. So you can decide 
that anything from a month old is cold and move it out. But with the exception of these directories, don't move these. So you can set the, the policies that would, that would decide what is cold. And how long you sleep even we can... And how hear. long you sleep. If it doesn't have to be a week. It can be continuous yep. if you want. So those are all parameters you can change. I should probably get into the, the transparent move technology. I mean, we, we've talked what's, about it what's quite a, a What's a typical customer size-wise? I, mean, I mean, so at some point, it doesn't make sense, smallish kinds of sites, but what's, what's a customer range kind of uh, primary storage? This is, this is just file storage, right? It's not This blocked. is file storage, yeah. And we're basically, uh, you know, we look at, I mean, we're, we're basically looking at customers who have 100 terabytes and up. 100 Most, terabytes and up. 100 terabytes and up. Most of our customers in the petabyte range and to be honest with you, they'll pick up, a, start with a petabyte, and then very soon thereafter, pick up another three or four or five petabytes. So, uh, <clears throat> so we're, that's why we're managing multiple petabytes in general with our, with our customers. So for those customers that are doing that with the public cloud and the connections into there, what, what, net, what, what connections are you currently using in there? And what sort of performance are you seeing from that? In the way of, are they using Direct Connects? Are they using... Express routes, or is it that they're just standard? Using? Many are using just standard. Some are using direct. I mean, it's a whole varied, you know, so for me to, to tell you about the performance, it really depends on that particular, particular environment. And many of them, by the way, are going to object store on premise as well. You know, especially like our insurance companies and financial services companies, some of them have real uh, allergies to the cloud. <laughs> and they, you know, and they go into <clears throat> object stores. So, uh, the observer, um, do you need to backup it, it or, or uh, does it talk with the director and all the metadata moves to the cloud so you don't, uh, so it's a sort of stateless thing? The observer is completely stateless. Okay, good. It is, it, the only things the observers have that are state is, or, or that, that would be lost if all the observers were lost, is the credentials that, that get you to the, the, the filers and the, the mm. targets. Um, because we don't take those off premise and off the premises at all. Um, but other than that, as far as the configuration is completely mm. stateless, it can be swapped in. So let me, I'll draw some more lines up here to, to, to get that, that picture of what we're doing. We, we pretty much talked about it right here, but to, to show that, that transparent move technology at the core, that what, what allows us to work on all this is the comprise cloud file system. And that resides in the observer. And this is what gives a picture of the source file system, regardless of where the files have moved on the targets. And in fact, that, so, so just to quickly go through it, the, the observer will go over the, the, the source shares that you've got, qualify based on the plan, what is it that should be moved. When it, decide, when it finds something that should be moved, it copies it through the KCFS, into whatever target you're, you want to send that share to. Now, the, over here, it's, in general, the, the file is native in the targets, so it can be seen at the targets. And in KCFS, when you see it through KCFS, you see it as though it's an extension of the source share. So we have, it have in, in, in effect, made the source share much deeper, much bigger, by just providing those, uh, by, by providing the ability to access files from, that were on the source, through KCFS. And after all of this has been guaranteed to go through and is perfect and is all validated, then we come in here and replace that file with that comprised dynamic link, with a symbolic link. So now, when a user accesses that file. Is there any subsequent um, monitoring of the files on secondary storage going through a pass to see if they are actually still there, or if they've gone or something like that? You know, reliability of the secondary storage could be a concern. Yeah. So. If, if, it's on your, if it's on the customer's NASs, they're, they're responsible for, for backing that up and maintaining But you don't go through a pass and like every couple of months <laughs> periodically assess whether this, the objects on S3 are still there and still well, present. We, so we do have um, what's called a, a synchronizing um, mechanism in here. So there, there's a, we do source target sync and make sure that the source and the target are exactly what they're expected to be. Because if you took links over here and move them around, they now point, that you, you, we will want them to point to something different on the target, so then we'll move the things at the target. So yeah, we, we do periodically go through there and make sure that everything in the source is legitimately on the target. So in fact, we do a little more than what you were suggesting. 
So we don't aren't just looking at the target, we're looking at the making sure that the... You're looking uh, at the directory structures to make sure the file still exists where it was originally yes. moved. But I'm worried about, you know, if stuff is sitting on tape for months or years or something like that, I want to have something that goes out there and periodically assesses whether the tape's deteriorated and whether it's good or no. not. No, you don't uh, do yeah. anything like that. Yeah, no, we, we no, our, yeah. our notion is that, you know, you know that's robust storage, that's, that's the that's their purview of the, of the storage device at that point. Okay. So feature request is to <laughs> background Check. hash Validation. all the data and compare it to hashes in KCFS and ensure integrity. Some sort of integrity check over time. That would be nice. Okay. Yes. Uh, trust but verify. Yep. Yeah. And you like said for the, for the for the transparent move technology, there's a patent pending. Kind of like teenagers. Mm -hmm. For the transparent move, there's a patent pending. You yeah. said. So what happens if? So I have a one petabyte NAS, and I start to freeing space after a while, because everything goes on the object store. Okay. Then a massive. Uh, uh, after a while, no, I keep adding data, so it's more than one petabyte, and I need a massive recall from the object store. Do you have a mechanism to manage this? So, shuffle it around to to make it, you know, not full or not. Uh... So, wait, wait, so what you're saying is that you know, you, over time, you're putting in more than a petabyte. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, the original NAS system is one petabyte. Yes. Okay. Yes. You start moving things around, yeah. and it's. Empty, okay, but actually you have two petabytes after sure, a while. Sure. So you have sure. to manage. One is no, on it's secondary, a, it's one is primary. So, that, yes. so yeah, now. okay, so I hear you. So a couple of things. Again, as I mentioned to you, remember that this is old stuff that you haven't been touching. So again, if users are, are touching it and bringing it back, um, again, remember it doesn't always come back. It's got to be based on a, a, a policy. Um, it, it, it comes back. now. If suddenly all users are bringing back all two petabytes, I think that's very unlikely. And probably the more likely case is a bulk recall. And at that point, we check to make sure that there's room before we initiate that bulk recall. Or else yeah. you can target it and put it somewhere else. So yeah, it also could be that the next NAS you buy is not longer one petabyte, but it's yes. 100 terabytes. That's correct. Yes. Yes. How because much? You, uh, you, and, and then uh, one day you need 200 terabytes. And so yeah. the problem. It's the What's same. the requirement for, for cache storage, if that's the proper term, for the observer? I mean, do you have like, let's say I'm working with a petabyte of primary storage. What's an observer's cache storage look like? It's mostly the, the metadata that we maintain here. So it's just a metadata. But I thought when you do it, a recall. When you do a recall, then we'll put the files there. So as the files go out, these, are, these files are a year old already. So no one's going to access them. We do not cache them on the way out. We only yeah. cache the metadata so that we can rapidly recognize the target from the sources side. When the, we do the recalls, then they get cached. And then that, that, that's kind of a data cache inside KCFS that is aggressively flushed because you generally just want it a few times for a few hours and then you don't want it anymore. So it's relatively small from it's that relative, yeah. yeah. And you can have as many observers as you want? Yep, that's uh, the third part of what I was going to talk about, but yes. <laughs> so what kind of API access is there into KCFS? Because that's kind of the single point of truth, and if I'm doing metadata yeah. operations, I may want to ask there. Yeah, you may want to ask there. So that, I'm, I'll actually get to that right now if you want. I'll take yeah, perfect I'll, timing. I'll take us right there. Yes. So now that we've done this and done this 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 move based on the the plan policies, now let's see what happens where users can access this data. That's access anywhere. So we'll start with a, a user who wants to access a file on the on the, the source share. So they go to access the file on the source share and find the file on the source share. It's hot data. That, that's, it's going to access hot data. The next user comes by, gets hot data. We're not in the hot data path. Your expensive filers, your expensive policies over those filers, they're, they're protecting this hot data that these users are, are accessing all the time. A thousands of users, thousands of users show up, get data right off the source share, get tens of thousands of files right off the source share. Then one user comes by, and actually wants this year-old file. At that point, they're redirected to KCFS, which then brings back, which qualifies them against the metadata of the source filer. It's just effectively an extension of the source share. And then, they, then the, the metadata and the data are brought back from the target and delivered to them. 
cached in KCFS in case they go and do it again. Um, and then erased from KCFS, or they'll, they'll take the file and put it wherever they want it. Users can also access directly into KCFS. This is less frequent and maybe undesirable, but it's, they, they, they can then, if they just want to see the target picture, we have this one cloud view of what the source looks like on the target that they can see just by going straight to KCFS. They also- and Is that an SMB or an NFS mount? It's an SMB or NFS. Yeah, I should have mentioned it. All of this, <clears throat> totally vendor agnostic, everything is just NFS or SMB to us. We just work oh. over the standard protocols to try and make it as wide open as possible. Um, or they can go and they can find the, the files directly in the targets. Now, in that case, they need to be given the permissions to do that because they, whatever the attributes and the ACLs that were over on the, the source side are not preserved in the cloud object store. Right. So that, that needs to be a, a carefully, carefully allowed uh, access. You uh, uh, package, uh, I mean, when, when they're purchasing comprises a service, is the object storage somehow, somehow built through Comprise, or is it built no, directly no, from the customer? No, no, yeah, no. They, 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 will, they will have their own way of getting to the cloud. Different customers, especially these large guys, have all kinds of deals with storage vendors as well as cloud storage vendors, so we don't get in the way. And then another way that they can access is we can actually spin up a cloud observer. The same KCFS over the target storage. So somebody who wants, who wants to, oh. let's say a customer takes a project and they send it off and say, I don't need this project anymore, let me send it off to the cloud. And now they want it back. And they want it back in the cloud where they can rapidly see it, just spin up an EFS, recall it into, into that EFS, and then, and then work on it and then throw it away. Okay, but I could run my e-discovery indexer in an AMI mm -hmm. and not present any load to the primary storage because right. that is everything yes. everything I'm looking for is at least a year old because yes. the subpoena is for events back exactly. then. And that's, and that's <laughs> super slick. Exactly. That's a nice feature. And so I can fire that up as an, so you're going to give me an SMB interface yep. in AWS that my AMI can access. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that's what, that's, is, that's is what we meant read for a only? path to the cloud. Because, yeah. you know, if you change something there, what happens to the original? So it is read-only. Once you get into the target here, it's, it's read-only. We are not trying to create a global file system that will, okay. if I change something here... Can I use I the go, target also, uh, I don't know, I'm migrating data somehow, uh, So and I want to use the target cloud S3 as a data set for big data workloads that are... Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Read only and again. Yes. Read only. Unknown to so if you want to yes. pull this old data out, work on it in a data lake, chunk yeah. through it, and then write your results yeah. somewhere else, and then throw yeah. away what you copied yeah. out. You can also, again, EFS is about 30 to 90 times more expensive than the S3, than the, than the, than the Glacier. So imagine you bring it in here, they churn it, do whatever they want to do, and they can kill it because the copy is right here, mm -hmm. and we can make that happen. Yeah, so this, this, this EFS work here is work in progress. We, we're not... Not yet to that point, but it's, it's on the, the tight roadmap because this, this is a, a use case that we've gotten from customers that they want to do this. So, one more question. I, I realize you guys are, are you know, uh, a little bit early, but uh, has there been much work looking at the kind of attack surface this creates from a, from a leaking of information and, and you know, all the different kind of, I mean, this does create a, a like there's another, you know, I'm thinking in another, wow, that's a very useful thing I could find. You know, I mean, but I, I recognize there's a lot of work, you know, but I'm just kind of curious how, what you guys have thought about from a security point of view at this point. Yeah, from a security point of view, that, that, that's, that's kind of why we don't want to get into this management. This is, so, so we have sensitive customers who, whose IT is very sensitive, and so it's always their cloud storage. So they're the ones who protect the access to these, to these uh, devices. Okay, yeah, but for storage. actual cloud storage? But actually, yes. On, so then on, they, on your, on, on the list of features I'm asking for, Encrypt the files as they go up. Oh, so we so have that. Yeah, that, that that is a drawback because if the file is encrypted and you know you can access it only with the their solution, then yep, right. Because yeah, and that, and then it's useless for all the other use cases. 
We should have in, been in here unless, before when we were designing this. Unless, <laughs> we, unless the application that's accessed, so only the as, only applications that know the key can access the data. Yeah, but and then you have to implement it in your application, right. which is but, not the case for a, a So we have that data. ability, by the way. So we can do end-to-end -end, uh, in, encryption. It's available. It's their choice. Um, if they want to leave it to the cloud vendor, it's their choice. But I'm not just talking about like in, uh, data integrity. I'm also talking about just um, what I can glean from that file system. <laughs> For example, if I've gotten into someone and I don't know what other cloud services they use, right? Can I use that to then find a le more vulnerable attack surface somewhere else, right? Like what what can I glean from that information that then gives me more information than I would normally have? It might not be anything, but I'm just kind of curious if, if what thoughts have been put into it. Yeah, we haven't put much into. All this is to us is a bucket. You gave us a bucket and credentials. Um, would that bucket give hints of something else? Or, or what about the, oper the, the observer? The, the cloud observer? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, again, is in their data center, their, or their, their data center or their cloud. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, if, they, if somebody spun something up with some name that was indicative of some coming IP or whatever, yeah, you can, you can imagine that would be. And hopefully, that their administrators would, would run that show. And also, any access through observers, because we are persisting you know, all the POSIX ACLs and everything, right? So there are, there are checks in place from just the file system point of view that you cannot access, access the data, right? Because we are maintaining, our file system has maintained all the attributes that were on the source, so only those users have access to data when they come through the source or they come through the comprised file system. And it's only when you're going directly to the target where, and we have, we generally have customers who have put in a very good, you know, we tell them, hey, these are the things that we need to be able to function, right? And they only give us a key and a, and a secret ID that's only for comprise, that has put permissions and all the delete permissions that we need, and they don't give that, you know, user or key to anyone else, right? That's how they generally secure access to the actual target. So customers accessing like on-prem object storage, they would just fire up another observer if they really wanted to. You don't actually have a read-only cloud observer for on-prem right. object storage. Yeah, they, they, they would come straight through Directly the, through the, 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 the yeah, through the yeah. observer. If, if it and how easy is it to fire up multiple observers and stuff like that? It's very easy, and again, we're down to the next step, <laughs> scaling. <laughs> can, can I ask you, what happens if, uh, you know, uh, a sort of ransomware or, you know, security and start reading all the files, encrypting them. And so do you have a, an alerting system, monitoring system to prevent, you know, a massive read or, you know, send me an alert, look, somebody is reading all of your files. It's a strange you behavior for, for the- ransomware protection? Yeah. Our, okay, no, again, what, what, as was mentioned before, that you have, we have ways to limit how many you can read if, if the administrator wants okay, to do that, and those are the things that we can do. So if we, you know, if they can put in, hey, only so many from at a, at a particular time, and it exceeds that, we stop. Yeah, but you're you're only going to see references to files that have been migrated because the hot data is not in the data path. Yes. right. Yeah. So I I want Fair. somebody to find it before you would know. No, yes, but yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. if you have a large file system and uh, and you have somebody that or something that uh, yeah, I get where reading you're, I get where you're going, but I'm kind of like I'm scanned. I you know when this when the ransomware <coughs> hit the 500th file on the primary, I want to know about it. I right. You guys yeah. have to go well it's when it. This guy's yeah. followed 400 yeah. breadcrumbs. Exactly. It's kind of too late. Yeah. So that, exactly. that same goes for exactly. the virus. And by the time they get so the, yeah. even if it's a positive yeah. application, yeah. it yeah. can do damage. Right. By no, the yeah. time they get to 500 breadcrumbs, they should have gotten all many hot data, mission yeah. critical data. So that's something, again, that you would expect that, that the folks in the data center are taking care of. Yeah, oh. To some extent, it's stuff I want the NAS vendors to start building in, because yeah. Mm. Yeah. all the way back there. The scaling, no. Yeah, so now uh, I'll, I'll talk about scaling. So as was mentioned, the, the, the observer is just a, a virtual client. It's downloaded from the director or, or provided to them, um, provided to the customer. 
It's set up against the director, through the director, set up against the director, and then configured through the director. And then once you've set one observer up, scaling is just snap in another observer, point it to the same director, it joins, there's a tight grid of the observers, so they're all aware of each other and can manage themselves even if the director is disconnected. The observers still operate. One of these observers, we, we now have a highly available system, so one of these observers is gonna be hosting the access address. That access address is that dynamic link address. So let's say it's this one that's hosting the address. Each of them has KCFS in there. One of them is hosting the address. And then if the others are watching that one to make sure that it will all work, and if, if uh, that hosting observer has problems hosting the access address, then another uh, observer picks up the access address. Can you expand that observer to a different site? So that would be another site. Okay. Is, is, is the another? best way to do it. Because we really want this locality to storage. If the storage is in a, a city that's 200 miles yeah, anyway, away. Anyway, NFS and SMB are local. Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the other observers are not really <laughs> participating in transparent moves. They might be participating in recalls, though, or so? so there are hundreds or thousands of shares over here. Yes. And those are load balanced across the observers. So each okay. observer has, is responsible for so many shares, and it oh, does really? all the work for that share. Even though the director, had, there's one observer that has, hosts the IP address. One hosts the IP address for recalls, for access. And that's the only thing it does is access. For access. Right. But it will then, the, the, the hard work of getting things into a cache is done by whatever observer is hosting the share that's being accessed. And then this one just pipes oh. out the, the result. Uh, yeah, and that one observer that hosts the access acts like a switch. So when it comes in, when the request right. comes in, it says, well, that observer over there is the one who owns that, owns that share, and this is a request from that share. It fat forwards it to the host. We call it the host observer. So it effectively, then manages the share everything. is dedicated to a particular observer for work to move data effectively. Yes, yep. and but that's the, not the done the manually. The it's load balance. One balanced. primary observer, let's call it, is the one that's actually Switching the work towards the other observers. Exactly. Switching the access work. Yeah, just the access. A load balancer. Yeah. 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 Hmm. <coughs> and then once it does the switch, it's out of the path. So that's yeah. that's important. How many customers do you have now? Um, we don't say. We have that. over seventy customers, and they're big enterprises managing petabytes of data. So. Yeah. Have you had any customers that are trying to address GDPR leveraging this platform? So why? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's very you've, interesting. You've got a breadcrumb, yep. you've got a whole workflow, you, yeah. and you can monitor all the access yep. in and out. So, Do you ever yeah. heard of Government. GDPR here in the US? <laughs> <laughs> we hear GDPR. Yeah, so we actually added some features for GDPR. Um, so one of the things customers want to do is when they comply with the right to be forgotten, for instance, they have to delete all that data, but they don't know if there's any dangling usage or reference to the data. So Comprise actually has a feature <coughs> called confined data, where you can move data outside the namespace, so users and applications cannot see it, but the data is not deleted, it's in a hidden location, so IT can ensure that there is no access to that data before they delete it. So it's a staged way of Quarantine. handling the yeah, right that, to be forgotten, for instance. That's cool. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Are there any other questions? Yeah. What's the pricing model? Do you want to talk about the pricing model as well? Yeah, Comprise is priced on the capacity that we manage. And we made it simple because customers did not want to have multiple prices. They just wanted a single price. So when you buy Comprise, let's say you bought Comprise for five petabytes of data, you can analyze the five petabytes, you can archive as much of it as you want, you can replicate as much of it as you want. Comprise has a replication feature as well to copy data to a lower cost uh, location. Uh, you can confine it, you can migrate data. We also do NAS migration, so you can do NFS to NFS, SMB to SMB migration. It's all included. You don't pay for every usage. It's, it's everything a subs included. subscription. You be offered the product through subscription or perpetual license. It's up okay. to the customer. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the replication capabilities. So you can replicate the archive data or replicate the primary data or, or you know, what is going on here from a replication perspective? What do you mean by replication? The, 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 the copy, copy feature does 10. 
the, the copy feature. So the, the, where you, yeah, so part of the plan, you can move things and leave the links behind, but you can also just do a straight copy. And in that case, the, the exactly the same operations and qualifications oh, that go in okay. there and say what should be moved, I just want a copy of it and I want to leave it here. So now it's both on the source and oh. on the target. And, Next and you can move. copy it from primary NAS to like object storage, is that? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. As far as you're concerned, it's all the same. It's all the same, yeah. And so, I can set up a policy that copies every file when created to the object store and then 90 days later replaces the primary with a oh, breadcrumb. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. This is a use case we see a lot in research uh, yeah. in university settings where they don't have the funds to have a identical mirror site. So often their NASs are unprotected. They don't mm -hmm. have a mirror. Uh, and so using Comprise, they put a low cost copy of that data in the cloud. And that, that it expands the, the, the data protection of your source. So, so uh, source shares that you don't think are, are worth all of the mirroring and backup because it's just below the cut line of, of, that, of spending that expense. You can now give this low cost uh, backup to it. So one more thing while, while we're talking about the scaling, yeah. a feature that's in beta now, because we have this distributed grid here, we can also and, and because we look at all your files, we do analysis on all the files, and so that, that picture that was seen in the demo, that's an analysis of all the files at kind of the share level and at the, the grouping aggregate level of the, of the data. But we also have um, Deep Analytics, which is a distributed database of all of the files, one record for every file. So now you can do advanced queries, and what you saw in those donuts and in those charts, you can now get down to the file level and see the particular files that match some query. You can save some queries. Um, this, is, this, has been, this is used by customers today, even though it's in beta, um, so that they can provide their customers with, no, really, you have some old files, here they are. And it's really effectively the metadata from the file system that you're, that you're in this deep yeah. analytics database. Yep, yeah, it's the metadata from the file system. And it, it's a, it lives in the same grid as the observers do. It's, yeah. it's, it's architecturally identical to the way that we've gotten that distributed grid. So it works very well. It, it's providing a new feature and a new, a new desire that, the, that these customers have to, yeah. to get more handle on their data. Allows you to find that needle in the haystack even if you've got 40 billion files or what have you. Um, and again, because it's distributed, as you were saying, we can go into environments with 100 petabytes of data and show that it works. I mean, to, to extend that, I mean, some of the questions you've been getting have been because a lot of us are looking at this and going, oh, that's a nice little black box that everything's going to that is looking at a lot of behavior. What, you know, how can I use that to look at behavior across a lot of different platforms? And so as you, are you looking to just present that deep uh, tree so other people can work on it? Or is there intent to actually develop... Um, I mean, I hate to use such a uh, uh, overly used term, but machine learning or, you know, it's some kind of a, a more intelligent behavioral analysis where once a customer's had this for, say, two, three years, what can you, what can you tell? Like, what can you see from that? I think a bit of both. So I think we're heading towards that. We don't have that as of today. But not only can we do that, for example, within a specific customer, I think someone had brought up the fact that we can <clears> see <throat> patterns across customers oh, as well. Interesting. Okay and something that we're looking at, but I don't want to talk too much about yeah, it right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, that's cool though. Yeah. What about with custom reports? Uh, uh, yes, we do have custom reports, we can go into that, but a lot of the stuff that's going on, what we're analyzing, um, what we're moving, um, if there are any transient errors when we move those things, all those sorts of things are there. Um, you know, for just yesterday we were with a, with a customer, again, a very large insurance company, and they were saying, look, I need to look at shares. We've got lots of shares owned by users that have never been touched. I want to turn them off. Can you do that? Yes, we have custom reports that kind of give you, you that have, kind of information. You have support for like multi-tenancy where, you know, I have multiple customers operating on this storage, uh, primary storage. How would that work? Would it be separate director slash observer grids uh, associated with each tenant? Is that how it would work? Right now, that's what it is. We, we and then do they, have... So some shares would be assigned to one of those and the other shares would be assigned to others kind of thing. Well, it's, it, the, it, the, the site kind of defines these are, these are the sources that are close to these observers. And then it, right now it's managed by uh, a director. For multi-tenancy, we, we get these requests from like MSPs who, who do operate a lot of places. And it's, 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 it's in our roadmap. 
to be able to provide that. We call it multi-site. I want to mention we do have customers that have central IT offering storage as a service to different departments, and so they want to show each department sure. what their usage looks like and set policies for the department, and the compressed policy groups is what they use for that. So okay. you can group shares into policy groups, <coughs> and, and you know you can get reports by policy group. Yeah. Can you set those policies based off of specific file types? Yes, you can set, and you could set exclusions as well. You could exclude certain types or certain users, et cetera. Yeah, and you can do that on a per group basis. I kind of whipped through it in the demo, but yes, it's available. And those policies can be essentially centrally managed and shared to those multi tenant? Okay. That's correct. And did you mention the size requirements for the um, observer? Oh, the, the system requirements for your environment? The do you want to talk to that? The system, yeah, Moet, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, uh, we, you know, again, it depends, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, we have customers with, you know, petabytes of data and they start from 100 terabytes as well. But <laughs> our, our typical recommendation is uh, 8 core, 16 gig memory. Uh, but there are factors that kind of come into the play, you know, how many files they have, because it depends upon the number of files, how many shares they have, because we do store much more aggregated information and show you detailed analysis share by share basis. So those kind of kind of things takes into effect of how much, uh, how how big the how big the observer should be. But eight core, sixteen gig. That's how we you know that's what our typical recommendation is. And and one of the things actually what we do is when we first run in the pre proof of concept, yep. we get to see all the files, the file sizes, and things of that sort. And that actually helps them plan out the deployment. Do you guys plan on making an appliance of this, or just keeping it strictly all virtual? No, that's a, that's a possibility you know, in the compliance area. We're looking at that, but it's not something in the near term. Are the majority of your customers trying to run it in the SaaS model versus on-prem? I, I think it's about 50-50. It's wow. about 50-50, yeah. Any, so go ahead. please, go ahead. So even though you're vendor agnostic, are you leveraging any direct integrations with vendors with the OEMs for the storage arrays to do the data and migrations? Or well, well, for example, we have a design win right now with AWS um, where uh, you know, some, of our, some very large companies are moving their data to you know, the S3 storage, but they feel that, hey, I've got so much data, that gets expensive. Can you move it into, can you tier it? Can, our, can comprise not only archive, but tier the archive? To the to Glacier, yeah. and the answer is yes. And of course, the next question is, and then can you bulk recall it from Glacier in the event that we're going to do something new? And the answer is yes again. And that's a new design win that we have with AWS yeah. as an example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, would your end game to be acquired again? Seeing how you guys have sold <laughs> previous companies. You know, you never say never. Uh, <laughs> but you know, like I said, we've been acquired once, and we like to try something new every once in a while. So that's always a possibility. One more question on the copying. I know you said the copying will work one direction, but once you have it on the secondary targets, uh, what I'm ask, essentially asking is some of the secondary targets, some of the, the balance that's done on decisions is, is all that data recoverable, right? Is that the medium or wherever you're putting on, is it easy to recover? And so could you use this to say validate an archive? Could you say use this to say on an occasion actually check whether what's being stored at S3 or what's being stored on tape is actually recoverable, is actually been, can be recalled, and it's, it is accurate. That would be a new, a new thing that we would, we would need to put in. Tape validation could be interesting. <laughs> yes, tape, tape validation tape would be the, the harder yeah, one and real, expensive yeah. one. I, I did have another question. Um, someone was asking about release cadence on the application, like how often you're releasing updates. Oh, I see. Or patches. Okay. Generally, we try to do this on a quarterly basis. We have a very iterative motion inside the company. Um, <coughs> but generally, we try to do it iteratively, um, and um, it's on a quarterly. But the, and those are like the, 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 the small patches and so forth. But the big releases try to come out you know, twice a year. Do I have to reinstall that observer, or is there just an upgrade? No, no, it's a very smooth upgrade. Um, you, I don't know if you want to talk through the upgrade, but. Um, yeah, you just, just put, put the, the upgrade in the director. It pulls the pieces apart upgrades itself, the observers see that they need an upgrade, do, they get an do, upgrade. Do your policies allow you to control which secondary storage, let's say you've got both AWS and on-prem object and tape, can you actually identify where files will go if you've got multiple types of secondary storage? Yeah, so, so the plan directs each source to a certain target, so a certain bucket. So each share effectively would be associated with a particular yeah, secondary storage. Exactly, that, that's where yeah. it's, it's extended to, yeah. so you, you get that. Yeah. 
kind of. The other thing is that you, we have this notion of group, so you can say these are all these shares in this group, and this group always goes to this object store. And so then as you add storage shares to that group, it automatically goes to the same place. So something along those lines. And that's share not folder, right? That's sure. share not folder. 